Hello, uh, my name is David Hahn, and I'm the team leader of Syria Team B. Our policy is titled Smart Power Peace Building in Syria. After me, you'll be hearing from Obia Oforiara, our regional expert, then Ziv Dalshaim Kahana, our rebel expert, and finally, Lesya Meleshkevich, our military expert. Former President Obama's strategy of leading from behind has thus far failed in Syria. Without US leadership, our regional allies have advanced their own narrow self-interest by funneling money and arms to extremist rebel groups at the expense of order in Syria. In turn, extremist jihadist groups like ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra have taken advantage of this chaos by recruiting fearful and economically stricken young men. Our current leading from behind strategy is morally reprehensible, especially considering that hundreds of thousands of civilians are dying. The US has been complicit in the humanitarian disaster in Syria by virtue of inaction. Humanitarian disasters and radical terrorism will not disappear from the Middle East unless we have a stable Middle East. But we will never have a stable Middle East uh, without a stable Syria, free from civil war. The civil war has no end with, uh, with Assad in power. Therefore, Assad must be expelled from leadership or go into internal exile. In reality, Assad is thriving on the West's hesitation. The US must start leading from the front. Given all this, we have identified three interests uh, pertinent to the US, which are stabilizing Syria, fighting terrorism, and promoting human rights. To this end, our policy prescription is to, one, create safe zones with Turkey and Jordan with support from Russia. Two, work with regional allies, including the Gulf states, Jordan, Turkey, the Kurds, and Russia to fight against extremist terrorist groups. Three, increasing funding for the Kurds and anti-Assad rebels. And four, forge a Syrian confederation with multi-ethnic government as well as three semi-autonomous states. Unfortunately, the time is ripe for action. Regarding the confederation, Syria is already divided. The longer the war rages on, uh, the more the country will be torn apart. Any military option is a bandage to the wound. A more, a more formal political settlement is necessary to actually cauterize that wound. In the interest of stabilizing R Syria, a confederation is better than a partition because the latter divides a nation and is likely to breed further interstate conflicts. On the, co on the contrary, a confederation unifies the nation while still allowing for autonomy. The confederation plan provides proper incentives for power sharing so that the three ethno-religious states can coexist. Next, the Kurds and the rebels. With Assad winning, the US must increase funding and support for the anti-Assad rebels to box in Assad. Past train and equip efforts have produced mixed results, but primarily because of underutilized resources. Our military expert will speak on the topic later, uh, but with an improved train and equip program, the US will turn the tide of war. By increasing the threat, Assad will be forced to accept this confederation deal. Regarding terrorism, the fight against ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra has been a long and uh, trying uh, effort, but the coalition has made progress. If you'll direct your atten attention to the slide, the area under ISIS control has decreased from this to that. ISIS is losing ground, figuratively and literally, uh, especially considering how ISIS lost Mosul and is completely surrounded by Kurdish uh, Syrian Democratic Forces in Raqqa as we speak, the coalition has been successful. And to further fight against ISIS, we should ramp up the train and equip program for the Kurds. Next, safe zones. Russia, Turkey, and Iran met in Astana, Kazakhstan for the fifth time just two weeks ago. There they proposed four de-escalation zones, but no agreement was signed. Then the US and Russia agreed to a ceasefire in southwestern Syria. Russia guaranteed the US that Assad will abide by the agreement. Uh, and alongside Russia, we'll be working with Turkey and Jordan uh, along their respective borders to establish safe zones. They both have expressed interest in working with the US. And given the trajectory of cooperation between the, uh, the US and Russia, now is the perfect time to set up safe zones. And with that, I'll turn it over to our regional expert. Hello everyone, my name is Obia Furiata and I am the regional expert. As depicted by the graph, the Syrian civil war entails the different and often opposing interests of regional and international actors ranging from France to the Kurds. Thus, a unilateral United States approach is heavily flawed. My presentation will focus on regional interests and our recommended US policies regarding ISIS, Assad, and the Confederation in that order. 
In September 2014, 68 countries came together to pledge their commitment to the fight against ISIS. Fortunately for the United States, many of its allies in the Middle East and the Gulf states are a part of this global coalition. In 2011, immediately following the Arab Spring, the Syrian crisis was localized. However, by 2012, with the appearance of Jabhat al-Nusra, Hezbollah and Kurdish forces, the civil war escalated to global proxy war status. Bearing this in mind, there is a need to work in conjunction with regional and international allies to combat ISIS and achieve our end game of a Syrian confederation. Since 2014, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, United Arab Emirates, Turkey, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Australia, and Canada have shown keen interest in combating ISIS either militarily, economically, or in both ways, and continuously express willingness to do so. Thus, it is prudent to use tried and tested alliances from the global coalition against ISIS for a multilateral US-led intervention. This coalition is large enough that it won't place a strain on any individual country, but small enough that a consensus can be reached. Our premise is that the US's present half-hearted commitment has led to a prolongment of the Syrian crisis and the absence of a US-led intervention would only serve to escapade the situation. Thus, in addition to their demonstrated commitment, the US would wield its influence and sway as a superpower to bring all actors to the table for a coalition. Our mission is costly and will require ground forces, mainly from regional powers, economic commitment and intelligence from all, and airstrike capabilities primarily from international actors. Despite Russia and Assad's false confidence, a more assertive U.S. stance towards Russia and Assad will bring them to the table. A combination of Russian and Syrian resources is no match for the resources at the disposal of the intervening faction of the global coalition against ISIS, especially when the U.S. steps up its commitment. With regards to Russia, this is one of the rare instances where we share the same goal of defeating ISIS. Additionally, we know their interests and fears in the region and can use this to our advantage. Russia's primary concern is not Assad himself. They are more interested in their naval base in Tartus and their air base in Latakia, as well as holding regional influence. Putin wants to remain domestically popular and a long drawn out war in Syria will significantly damage his image. Additionally, it will place an intolerable strain on Russia's economy and puts Russia at a greater risk of terrorist attacks by certain Sunnis frustrated by Russia's support of the Alawite minority. We argue that once Russia places into perspective the repercussions of a heavily stepped up US coalition, as well as their interests and fears, they would at the very least give some serious thought to our policy, which is to work in conjunction with the coalition against ISIS and push Assad to accept our confederation in exchange for leaving their bases untouched and retaining influence in the Alawite region of the confederation. Even further, coordinating efforts with Russia will reduce the number of accidental hits on anti-Assad rebels in the name of fighting ISIS. At this point, it can be argued that working with Assad is a misguided policy. He has been emboldened by continuous Iranian and Russian support and shows no sign of stepping down. However, once increased supplies and training of anti-Assad rebels begin to turn the tide of the war, we argue that the establishment of a semi-autonomous Alawite state would appear a more attractive deal for him. It is likely that he would much rather go into self-exile or rule an Alawite state than flee the country or risk getting killed. On the other hand, deposing Assad would require an inordinate amount of firepower and diplomatic prowess, a feat that is further complicated by the geopolitical interests of regional actors. Supplanting Assad will also leave the issue of immediately finding a replacement that is accepted by all sides. As a result, a Syrian confederation is the lesser of two evils. This confederation will be made up of three semi-autonomous states, a Kurdish state in the north, an Alawite state in the west, and a Sunni Arab state in the east. 
This would in many ways model the Dayton Agreement in Bosnia, but with specific parameters that reflect this region's peculiarities. A confederation is preferable to a partition because it allows for self-determination, autonomy, and promotes unity among states, which will in turn reduce interstate rivalry as they still remain one country. First, each state's borders, while roughly matching the location of respective ethnic groups, would be open to all. That is, anyone of any ethnicity can live in whichever state he or she prefers, in essence, curbing massive migrations. Additionally, the national constitution would guarantee protection for ethnic minorities by preventing each state from passing discriminatory laws. The federal government would be co-shared by the three self-determined states in the hopes that the egalitarian nature of this confederation would decrease ethnic tensions and promote a true desire to work together to accomplish common goals. Our prescription does not advocate for long-term U.S. presence in Syria. Such a policy would not only be economically costly and politically unpopular, but would give the appearance of the U.S. meddling in the affairs of the Middle East thus aggregating anti-American sentiment. Instead, we will place the onus on regional countries backed by the U.S. to enforce the basic provisions of the Confederation Plan as well as the Syrian people themselves. It is important to grant regional countries and the Syrian people this responsibility as the crisis affects them most. Further than that, it might be reasonable to hope that the Confederation policy proposal would be a good way to bring all vital parties to the table and would at least stop the violence. Next, I'll turn it over to our rebel expert. Good afternoon. I'm Steve Dalsheim Kahana. I'm the rebel expert, and I'm going to discuss the role that Syrian rebels have in US policy in Syria. The instability in Syria has led to the formation of over a thousand rebel groups with a variety of ideologies and goals. Some of the smallest groups are simply interested in protecting the autonomy of their own neighborhoods, while other larger ones want to expand their territory and seek to perhaps one day replace Assad. Some focus primarily on fighting each other, while others put their efforts into fighting regime troops. Their ideologies range from pro-secular democracy to moderate and open-minded Islam, to extremist Salafist fundamentalists. Though there are so many rebel groups, the two that pose the largest threat to the United States are ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra. Fortunately, at the moment, both are currently rivals and occasionally clash. ISIS's territory is in the eastern part of the country, while al-Nusra is fighting all over the country, but is especially strong in the northwestern Idlib province, near Damascus, and in the southwestern Dara region. Both ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra are Sunni Islamists with ambitions to carry out terrorist attacks in the United States. A bigger worry, however, is that they will continue to destabilize the region and cause American casualties in Syria and Iraq. Another worry is what has been termed catastrophic success. That is, if the Assad regime falls too quickly, the power vacuum could be filled by anti-Western fundamentalists, destabilizing the region and posing a much larger threat to the United States than stateless terrorist organizations currently do. Our key rebel allies in Syria are the Free Syrian Army, the Syrian Democratic Forces, and the Southern Front. The Free Syrian Army, originally a coalition of over 30 groups, has gone through a lot of internal turmoil recently and now seems to be almost entirely powerless. The Syrian Democratic Forces, composed primarily of Kurdish YPG, have been ex especially successful in fighting against ISIS. They operate in northern Syria along the Turkish border. The Southern Front is a coalition of over 50 moderate groups operating in southwestern Syria in the Dara, Asaweda, Kunaitra, and Damascus regions. They have received a lot of American support. As they are a powerful group operating in a region where stability is key for Jordanian and Israeli security, it is essential that they continue to receive support from the United States and other allies. In the fight against terrorism, our best option is to provide financial assistance and military training to rebels who fight against terrorist organizations such as ISIS, al-Nusra, Arar al-Sham, and Iranian-funded groups such as Hezbollah and some members of the Popular Mobilization Forces. We can't pretend that ISIS is the only threat. There are numerous terrorist organizations that are sometimes forgotten in U.S. policy, especially al-Nusra. An American policy in Syria that doesn't confront both ISIS and al-Nusra 
will only lead to further trouble and instability down the road. By providing assistance to Syrian rebels fighting terrorists, rather than fighting them with American troops, we avoid American deaths, allow locals to fight for their future prosperity, and avoid increasing anti-American sentiment, which is almost always the effect of putting large numbers of American boots on the ground. Assad is currently winning the war. Many of the rebel groups are disorganized, and Russia's support has tilted the war towards the regime. It is time for the United States to step up to the plate and use our resources to be an effective world leader. Now is a potential turning point in the war. If we continue our withdrawn policy, the Middle East will remain dangerously unstable for decades to come. However, if we start using our power more effectively, we can turn this war around before it is too late. The current problem is not due to American incompetence, but rather an unwillingness to confront the Syrian civil war head on. The United States has so far done an embarrassingly poor job when it comes to putting resources into train and equip programs. By putting more resources into training and equipping successful rebel groups, such as the Kurds and the Southern Front, the United States can turn the tide of this war and drive Assad into a corner. The Kurds, who live primarily in northern and northeastern Syria, have done an excellent job fighting ISIS and al-Nusra. Working with them is essential if we are to destroy jihadists in the region. However, another one of our key allies, Turkey, is vehemently opposed to any Kurdish military strength. We must work out a deal between the Kurds and Turkey so that we can work with both. The Kurds have been betrayed over and over by world powers, including the United States. They've been promised independence with that promise never coming to fruition. A semi-autonomous Kurdish region would, however, be in the U.S.'s interest. The Kurds would be a regional ally to the United States. They are a very diverse people and are notable for their progressive and democratic attitudes, primarily due to their own diversity. Turkey, however, is very worried about Kurdish independence. The Kurdistan's Workers' Party, or the PKK, is a militant group within Turkey that the United States classifies as a terrorist organization. It have caused Turkey a lot of strife, and there is worry within the country that Kurdish independence in Syria would aid the PKK in Turkey. In order to forge a deal and encourage cooperation between these two essential American allies in the fight against terrorism, the U.S. should bring both parties to the table by offering the Kurds a semi-autonomous state in return for ceasing terrorist activity in Turkey, including an end to weapon smuggling. This offer would, at least partially, mollify both parties, as the Kurds essentially want self-governance, and the Turks essentially want to contain Kurdish aspirations for their own state. Regarding the Kurds, Turkey's primary concern is that a Kurdish semi-autonomous zone would empower the PKK. In order to assure this agreement, the U.S. would place peacekeeping troops on the Syrian side of the Turkish border to ensure that the Kurds don't smuggle weapons to the PKK. In addition, we would publicly assure Turkey, United States, and potentially NATO support in the case of Kurdish aggression. On the other hand, the U.S. would strongly condemn any Turkish violence against Syrian Kurds. The U.S. peacekeeping troops could act as a buffer between the Kurds and the Turks, just as they successfully did in early March in Manbij in northern Syria. It is important to acknowledge that any attempt to give the Kurds even partial autonomy will anger the Turks. However, Kurdish support is essential to our counterterrorism efforts. And the Turks are not blameless in this conflict. Turkey has supported whichever rebel groups, including extremists, that it believes are effective in fighting the Syrian regime. Their policy is overly lax and has led to the rise of extremist groups in Syria. They have allowed foreign fighters to cross their border into Syria with little to no regulation. And while our group believes that this sort of agreement between the Kurds and Turkey would placate most of Turkey's fears, we're willing to lose some Turkish support in exchange for the long-term benefits of partial Kurdish autonomy. We understand this isn't a perfect plan, yet it would be our best option to maintain positive relations with both allies. The Syrian civil war has been one of the worst humanitarian disasters of the 21st century. One of our first steps would be to establish safe zones with Turkey and Russia in the north, and with Jordan and Russia in the south. This would significantly reduce the flow of refugees to Europe. Successful safe zones may even encourage refugees abroad to return home. Additionally, they will provide a safe haven so we, that we can finally reduce civilian casualties. These safe zones can provide the starting point for a confederated Syria. Our end game is to st stabilize Syria and help put in a governmental structure that provides groups with self-determination and preserves peace. By proposing a confederation peace plan along the lines that Obia mentioned in her portion of the presentation, the United States will further counterterrorism efforts, advance human rights, and stabilize Syria 
and ultimately the region. Our end game is a Syria in which all will have an opportunity to work together to rebuild their country. Next, I'll turn it over to our military expert. Hello, I'm Lesia Malishkevich, our team's military expert. Our military is a key element of our policy. Though the U.S. suffers from what some call Iraq syndrome, our team argues that a systematic and deliberate use of our military, in conjunction with our allies, could prompt the eradication of ISIS and a renewed Syrian state. I'll begin with our military's role in the safe zones. Protecting civilians is one of our fundamental reasons for intervening in Syria, and safe zones provide a location for internally displaced civilians to remain without abandoning their country altogether. Troop presence is a necessary component of this plan. The Pentagon has estimated that establishing a secure safe zone along Turkey's northern border, along Turkey's border, will require between 15,000 and 30,000 troops. Meanwhile, the Pentagon has placed a formal cap of approximately 500 troops deployed in Syria. Creating safe zones is the first step to achieving a stable Syria, so we must invest financially and militarily in this endeavor. Thus, we should increase this troop cap to send more of our soldiers to the designated zones. But the onus will not only be on the U.S. to provide these troops. Other countries have attempted to create safe zones as well. Most recently, Russia, Turkey, and Iran discussed the possibility of creating de-escalation zones together, but the agreement fell through. Most famously in Aleppo, where Syrian and Russian planes continued to target civilian hospitals and were never held accountable for their actions. By negotiating safe zones on our terms, we can enforce them against any potential breaches and protect the displaced civilians. Russia may be seemingly hesitant to work with us on these zones, but Putin has many reasons to consider cooperating. In fact, the US and Russia have already worked on a de-escalation zone along the Jordanian border, which has held strong so far. So the precedent for successfully working with Russia is there. Additionally, Russia wants this civil war to end as much as we do, as it continues to be a drain on its economic resources and Putin's domestic popularity. Even if Putin believes he's on the winning side of this war, it is in both of our interests to establish safe zones sooner rather than later to expedite the end. We also propose to work with Turkey and Jordan. Turkey is motivated to stop the flow of refugees across its border and to contain the expansion of the Kurdish region. Turkey has also already demonstrated the capacity and willingness to send troops, so we should request their partnership. Jordan also wants to curtail the flow of refugees and secure its border so we see Jordan as a strong ally in the South. Both of these countries have also attempted to work with Russia in the past, and working together again can be a continuation of previous negotiations. Given vast differences in military support, U.S. presence in the Northern Zone will be notably smaller than our presence in the Southern Zone, where Jordan faces greater economic strain and has numerically fewer troops to contribute. But Russia has stated that their military police are available to secure the safe zone as well. Overall, the U.S. should accept the military and economic costs of taking on the safe zones because these costs are necessary and good investments in the short-term safety of civilians and the long-term stability of the Middle East. Our concrete role in the safe zones will include stationing our troops within the zones defensively, with the supplies to shoot down planes from overhead, but also with the capacity to strike offensively. When people discuss safe zones, the primary concerns are escalation with Russia and mission creep. We must remember that Russia wants to avoid any direct conflict with the United States as much as we want to avoid escalation, and clearly stating our intent to enforce the no-fly zone will communicate our seriousness with Russia. Combining this pledge of enforcement with our cooperation in the zones significantly diminishes the, pop the pop possibility for escalation. Additionally, the apprehension towards mission creep is misdirected. Past experience has shown that demonstrating our willingness to militarily protect ceasefire zones is a strong deterrent and actually prevents mission creep. When Iranian-backed troops approached a ceasefire zone near Al-Tanf in May, we used airstrikes upon their encroachment, and the troops backed down. Though our troops will be positioned defensively, the U.S. will not shy away from using airstrikes to establish our military position, because a tough stance is a proven method. Next, the U.S. Operation, US military's operation against al-Nusra and ISIS. In the continued fight against these terrorist groups, the U.S. should employ its military intelligence to push our allies to send more funds and troops to the ground. 
since our allies have already demonstrated their commitment to fighting ISIS and have sent troops to Syria for this purpose, the U.S. role should primarily be in coordination and leadership. ISIS in particular has recently lost much of its territory, so now is a better time than ever to turn a larger coalition of forces against ISIS and potentially lead to the group's final demise. Attacks by allies have generally been uncoordinated, so the U.S. should lead our allies from the global coalition against ISIS to organize airstrikes, prevent the targeting of moderate rebel groups, and protect civilians from any misfire. The U.S. should also increase our own airstrikes against al-Nusra and ISIS leadership. In working with both our allies and the Kurds, there are likely to be moments of tension. To ensure that Turkey and the Kurds take our proposed compromise seriously, we will promise Turkey that we will come to its aid militarily and financially as a NATO ally if any non-state actor such as the Kurds attempts any attacks, while simultaneously refusing to condone any military action by Turkey against the Kurds. The presence of U.S. troops stationed between the two groups will encourage the Turkish fighters and the Kurdish rebels to adhere to the negotiated terms and prioritize the fight against ISIS rather than each other. Additionally, we will take a more active role with moderate rebel groups, including the Kurds, the Southern Front, and the Free Syrian Army. The government has already implemented a training program with goals to train up to 5,000 troops at the cost of $500 million. However, the program did not use all its allocated funds or train its target number of fighters, so as it stands, it has largely been unsuccessful. But a similar program has worked in Iraq, and making some key changes will improve the success rate of the program in Syria. We will alter the program by enlisting more people in the vetting process, so more fighters can receive the necessary training faster. We will also allow our specialists more independence in the decision-making process, as we trust our generals to make the proper low-level calls without having to verify every decision with Washington. We will use the combined knowledge of our commanders in Syria and our commanders in Iraq, who have worked with rebel groups to improve the program even further. We would waste our resources by continuing a small, lackluster program, but investing significantly in a remodeled training plan that will produce successful and capable fighters is an investment the U.S. should jump at the opportunity to make. Finally, Assad. Our military policy against Assad depends on his response to the Syrian Confederation proposal. Considering that our focus has primarily been on fighting ISIS, it is unlikely that Assad will actually be losing at this point. However, Russia is likely to realize our seriousness in turning our fight against Assad, and there is hope that Russia may help convince Assad to accept the plan for a confederation rather than continue in a drawn-out, resource-depleting war. This is even more likely if we consider that Russia's stakes in this war are not Assad remaining in power, but rather the retention of its air and naval bases and maintaining regional influence, both of which are possible if Assad accepts the confederation. Even if Russia doesn't agree to act as a negotiator, we will still communicate with Assad in the hopes that he agree preemptively to the plan. If Assad rejects the plan, which he likely will, the U.S. should encourage allied moderate rebels to fight Assad's forces by drastically increasing our funding of their military and aid provisions. We will continue pursuing this route until Assad concedes to the plan. But if Assad adamantly and consistently refuses to cooperate, as a last resort, we are prepared to pursue airstrikes against Assad's regime and force his hand. Upon his submission, the U.S. military will have little involvement in the creation of the Confederation as we will turn to diplomacy at that point. Our military assets have been underutilized in Syria up to now, and if the U.S. continues its uncertain support of the opposition groups against ISIS and Assad, then the war will continue to destroy civilian lives, and Americans will live with the knowledge that we were complicit in these atrocities. American military might is no panacea, but we are at a decisive moment against both ISIS and Assad, and we can use our resources to push for an expedited end to the war and a solution that calls for nationwide peace. I will now turn back to our team leader for some concluding thoughts. The Syrian civil war is a tangled net of con conflicting interests, religious sectarianism, and unimaginable human suffering. Millions of people and powerful nations have stakes in this conflict, and we realize that not everyone will come out a winner from this war. However, this is not a zero-sum game. Everyone can walk away with something, including Assad, but only if he's willing to work with us. And our, our policy does that. We balance out regional actors' interests while securing our own. By identifying common interests with our regional allies, and by being willing to lead from the front, we can do what is morally right while securing our interests. Our policy of creating safe zones, 
working, work, working with regional allies against terrorist groups, and increasing funding for the Kurds and anti-Assad rebels, and finally, forging a Syrian confederation is the best path forward in the long run. We'll be the first to admit that our set of policies requires a lot of resources, but the cost of inaction are significantly higher than the cost of action now. Like most Americans, our team is very wary of another quagmire in the Middle East. However, we cannot let ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra continue to exist, and we most certainly cannot allow civilians to be slaughtered in Syria. Especially considering our recent progress against ISIS, the U.S. should seize this opportunity to bolster anti-terrorism efforts. Regarding the safe zones, all the right actors are coming together for the first time to do what is right for the people of Syria. Establishing safe zones will hurt Assad politically and demonstrate that U.S. no longer stand by the sidelines. And finally, the Confederation. The natural borders are already beginning to solidify and Assad is winning. We have to act now to turn the tide of the war and force Assad to accept this deal. With Bashar al-Assad in place, the civil war is going to continue. And Syria will continue to be unstable while families die and terrorists thrive. Without a stable Syria, the Middle East will continue to be unstable. And no one wants that. The time is ripe and the costs of inaction are high. The U.S. needs to seize the moment to do what is best for America, our allies, and the people of Syria. Thank you. Okay, it's time for question uh, and answer period. Why don't we start with John? Uh, sure. Um, a central part of your proposal is the addition of new U.S. military forces and the presumption that they might be used in new ways if, if we can't strike the kind of deal that you have in mind. And yet you say that the fears of mission creep are misplaced. I'm trying to figure out how you don't get mission creep from this proposal. Right? In, I, I'm, the very terms of what you're suggesting expand more military forces in new missions for more ambitious political objectives. Isn't that the very definition of mission creep? Okay. And a related question, um, there's a deep tension in your proposal. Um, on the one hand, you very much want stability. Right? This is a, a, a thread that ran through your whole presentation. You need to have stability in Syria. And yet you ended with a plea for regime change. And I can think of nothing more destabilizing in any country than shattering the state and trying to build a new one. Right? So I want you to think harder and explain why you won't have U.S. mission creep and how you can have more stability while deliberately destabilizing the country. Sure. I can address the second part of the question uh, regarding regime change. Uh, so just to clarify, our policy doesn't advocate for regime change. Uh, it is essentially boxing in Assad into his Alawite zone and dividing up the country or uh, creating uh, a confederation uh, where the uh, ethnic and religious divides are naturally held. Um, and we believe that this will not cause uh, Syria to be unstable because uh, there will be regional allies enforcing these, uh, this confederation and for the peace. But through your presentation, you repeatedly said Assad is a, is a force for instability. It's, it's a moral imperative to, to, to shift him out. Is, are you being honest about this, that, that this is not about regime change? Because it sounds like it is. Uh, well, it sounds it, like your long-term goal is to get him out. It is really, it? our long-term goal um, is stability in the end. Um, what Assad does changes our, our, our policy depends on what Assad does, like Lesia said. Um, if he's willing to work with us, then he can stay in power uh, internally within his zone, but nothing more than that. And to add on to that, um, we feel that with Assad in power, you know, the, the massacre of the different ethnic groups is just going to continue, um, and true peace can't really be had. Um, so the, the reason our proposal is more stable is because we're not you know, going to go in with ground troops and forcefully overthrow him. We're going to give him the option to uh, join this confederation, which he can still hold some power, but not power over the whole country. Now, did I understand you, you, you assume that he'll reject the first offer? Yes, because at the moment he's winning. So he'll, reje he'll reject the first offer, and then we will aggressive, we'll be more aggressive towards him, either through funding locals or through bombing directly. Okay. 
So that brings me to the second question. How is this not mission creep? Um, well, our initial proposal for the safe zones in particular, um, we're goal, our goal is to be purely defensive in that. Um, we want to prioritize zones. civilian lives in the safe zones. Um, so the troops that are stationed there, um, a combination of Turkish, Russian, and um, American in the north, um, will act solely defensively unless um, someone else makes the first move. Um, if we see it absolutely necessary for the safety of civilians, we will act offensively. Um, but since the troops themselves are going to remain in the zones, um, there we don't see those zones as increasing. We don't have American boots on the ground outside of those zones. Um, so we don't view that as mission creep. And when the other part of our policy comes in, when we turn to um, funding anti-Assad rebels and potentially um, striking against Assad himself, um, that will of course be offensive in nature. Um, but our priority is still civilian lives and we see that using defensive methods is the best option at the moment. Chris? Yeah, uh, I'm going to build on Josh's comments. Uh, first of all, I, I was very impressed uh, at some of the nuance you handled. Uh, this is a very complex situation. I, I would also tell you that as a, you know, 29 years in the military, that this is a highly complex plan. Uh, that is has many it's fraught with uh, many tension points and I think the chances of success are diminished by how complex it is but having said that let me can you bring up the slide that has a sod can you bring that uh, that last slide before this penultimate so uh, how about this I think you know what Josh was really dialing in on is that a lot of this is contingent on how we approach a sod and how Assad decides to react to new realities, emerging realities and new realities. What if this? What if you came with a slightly different approach and we work with Russia? Because I think you did a good job of explaining why an agreement could be in everyone's best interest. What if there were two nations? What if there was Syria, which is Alawite land, and then a new nation that is a confederation uh, between Sunni and uh, the Kurdish. The reason why I say this is that could be something that we could get Assad and the Alawites to agree to. I've always said, look, even, even that region is still bigger than Lebanon, right? So it's not like the Alawites aren't going to have influence. And that's a reasonable area for them to control. And let's, let's be candid. I mean, Syria was basically a, a 1920s uh, contrivance from you know, Great Britain and others. So, I mean, there isn't anything sacrosanct about the current boundaries of Syria. If we, offer, if we were part of a, a multinational peace effort that said that there would be two nations, Alawite would be Syria, and then the rest would be a confederation, and then the construct for enforcement could actually be similar to K4. The, the Kosovar force that went in, which was also very complicated, but quite candidly successful. And I must say that I was dubious as to it. I, I participated in it. But I mean, I didn't really, I had severe doubts about it. It worked. And so I think you, I think you treated the Kurdish Turk challenge very sensitively, and even though it's ambitious, possibly it could work. And I think that the danger in the plan is currently constructed is I do agree that. If we try to do a confederation across, Assad's going to reject it. Now you're in a position where how do you deal with Sunni land, right? And the problem is, is that, I mean, this is why I, I agree with your assessment. I voted against arming rebels because I looked at the plan in detail and it was going to fail. It did fail. We lost a half billion dollars. I think if we try to do this, you're going to be stuck in the same situation. Whereas if you can get an interim agreement, now you could actually have a jurisdiction from which we could support we could actually uh, do a similar construct to the way we helped the Kurds in Iraq and even the Iraqi government in the final destruction of the Islamic State inside an interim government. Not, not rebel forces, but an actual government that's been UN acknowledged. So I'll just offer and see your reaction to that possibility of trying to simplify what is a very complex and, and, and very difficult uh, course of action. Um, I, I like that plan a lot. Um, one of the reasons we chose this plan instead is because we saw long term, hopefully, a situation in which Syria could be reunited. Um, I think in, in that plan, uh, you know, that could sort of uh, increase the ethnic tensions and potentially lead to war, especially since, you know, the Alawites would uh, get sort of this Western spine, uh, powerfully, e economically powerful 
uh, cities, and that could sort of put um, the, the other country in uh, a more sort of precarious economic situation. I can see why you'd yeah. say that, but is it realistic to think that you know you can actually be able to forge something like this when the, when the rebel groups are so disparate and, and, and it's really difficult for them to harness and, and they've always got Assad. And then the other question related is, have they gone too far already? In other words, one thing that does unite Sunni land and the Kurdish region is they hate Assad. Mm -hmm. I mean, they hate him as so much has happened, so much has transpired. Is it better to just recognize that and carve off and just call that Alawite land and then it's up to the Alawites what they decide to do. If they decide to move to a generation beyond, we hope that's where they go, but it's up to them. And then you can start somewhat fresh and new in the confederated area. Anyway, something to think about. Because as it's currently con constructed, it's very difficult from a military perspective to achieve this. So I'm actually not sure that the Kurds are super anti-Assad. In fact, they've been very pointed in fighting ISIS, and they don't get in the mix with Assad mm -hmm. if they can help it. They were totally accommodationist with the regime, um, selling oil to them through at least 2014. So I think the if you want to bet your strategy on Kurds, you can welcome to the Middle East. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> Have fun with that. Um, I want to talk about safe zones um, with a basic question of safe from whom? Um, well, the idea is both safe from ISIS and from Assad attacks, um, particularly the chemical warfare that we've already seen happen. Um, mm -hmm. Assad is not um, hesitant to act against civilians, so safe zones are prioritized. And so the no-fly zone then is only over the exact geography of the safe zone or has some broader uh, remit, broader need, scope? We're starting at least um, over the safe zone. That's the priority to make sure mm -hmm. that the civilians have a space where they can really continue to live within their own country. And so do we, ex why the attacks that Assad uh, has, the air attacks anyway, are those typically from uh, airplanes or helicopters? What's the nature of his air attacks on these that we've seen in Aleppo and Idlib and elsewhere? Do you guys know? I believe airstrikes. But from, from high altitude, from helicopters, from, from what? Uh, we do know that Russians, the Russians have been partaking in barrel bombing with their jets. Um, and also... It's kind of hard to barrel bomb the jets. So, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, they've been, they've been uh, throwing bombs at civilians in cities, uh, both the Russians and the Syrians. Uh, but the good part about our safe zone plan is that we're w working with Russia, uh, so... Yeah, I've got questions about that, too. Right. Um, I mean, so, I guess, why don't we have no fly zone right now? if it's so obvious that we should do so? Because we understand that the resources needed for that are extremely high. Um, it's very difficult to enforce, um, but our goal with the safe zone and combined with the no-fly zone, um, particularly when working with Russia, is that we have now combined resources and hopefully international support um, to enforce it, and that takes some of the burden off of the U.S. in particular. So part of the problem is that also, unlike the no-fly zones in Iraq in, in the 90s, these are attacks being done at 1,000 feet, not airstrikes from 25,000 feet. And it's really hard to patrol at that level. You make yourself very vulnerable to surface-to-air attack as well. right? So it's really unclear to me how US interceptors and fighter planes um, who don't typically fly below 10,000 feet, for example, um, are going to do a lot of patrolling against cargo planes and helicopters dropping barrels on civilian populations. right? So that's there's a basic mechanics of, of the no-fly zone that gets, that gets tricky there. Um, so this map is really interesting, and I think that there's a couple pieces of battlefield geography that I have questions about. Um, one is, there's not a ton of oil in Syria, but it's all in Deir ez -Zor, and we just gave it all to the Sunnis. So I'm curious as to why anybody else would agree to that, um, and if there are plans for, in the Magical Confederation, for some sort of revenue sharing, Iraqi style, uh, which also has some problems. Um, but is that, is that factored into your planning, or are we just given the majority sunny population or plurality of sunny population a big grab bag win by getting the oil fields? I think that was part of the reason why we chose a confederation rather than a partition, for mm -hmm. example. Um, a confederation will have the United Government who can help allocate those resources properly to the different regions, um, and it won't just be monopolized by the Sunni So region. that revenue should flow up in some way and then back out to mm -hmm. the 
other members of the state. Okay. Um, the other piece of the battlefield geography that's that's tricky is that I mean, Deir Ezzor is what comes next, right? So everybody's like hanging out around Raqqa for the most part, and that lets the Kurds fight ISIS, but not the regime. It lets the regime fight ISIS, but not the Kurds. That all is going to come to a head by the end of this year, probably, uh, as folks move through Raqqa and into Deir. Um, does this do the do the lines of this confederation change if the battle lines change on the ground? Does it matter who controls territory militarily by the end of the year? Or is this going to enforce this through some other means than who's physically on the ground? I'd certainly say this was a sort of preliminary plan. Um, we saw a map from the Rand Corporation mm -hmm. that we based this partially off of, but we, we had problems with that map. Um, and so I think the, the battle lines would certainly have an effect on this, and then obviously the final negotiations okay. were as well. I think the most alarming part of your plan is this notion of um, U.S., if I understand it properly, U.S. airstrikes against uh, the Assad regime. Um, how do you think Russia would react to U.S. airstrikes against their ally Assad and his troops? And is there a risk this could descend into effectively a U.S. on Russia initially proxy war and then ultimately have Russian <coughs> U.S. direct military confrontation you know in this um, in this country and is that is that worth the risk mm -hmm. so um, our plan doesn't begin with airstrikes against Assad um, that comes significantly later and it's again a last resort um, we hope to begin um, with negotiations with Russia that may over time increase to their acceptance of our plan to oust Assad uh, essentially or turn him into exile um, and we believe that Russia doesn't have an invested interest in Assad himself, um, and we think that we can give Russia anything that Assad could if we are able to go through with this confederation. So we don't see Russia uh, over time, rather, maybe now we could see that issue, but um, going with the negotiations with our plan, we think that Russia will, at the very least, be complicit if they know that they have a vested potential interest um, of keeping their naval and air bases and continue, uh, keeping regional influence in the Alawite region. Okay, I think we're uh, out of time for questions. Thank you again, Syria Team B. Um, let's take a five minute break and then we'll wrap up the Syria Team B.